Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Physical Attraction. This is the latest in our nuclear fusion marathon, from Jet to Eater. Last episode, we told you about the gradual squeeze on fusion budgets and funding in the 1970s and 1980s. Alongside this was a general drive towards making steps to make fusion more practical. Scientists wanted to bridge the gap between experiments that were designed to find out fundamental plasma physics quantities, and experiments that might teach them something about how to make nuclear fusion a real, viable power source. This led to an influx of engineers, a serious consideration of some of the practical problems that needed to be solved to harness the power that might be generated by a fusion reactor, and a general move towards a goal of break-even. It was clear that to demonstrate both to the general public and to people who were funding these experiments that progress was being made, that nuclear fusion was going to have to prove that it had the potential to become that clean-ish, cheap-ish, limitless-ish power source that had been promised for so long. So this, more than anything else, led to the goal of a fusion generator that would generate as much power as it was required to run. This naturally squeezed out most methods of magnetic confinement fusion apart from the tokamak, because after all the tokamak was the project that was the closest, and it was realised that a tokamak that could break even would have to be substantially bigger and more complex than anything that had previously been constructed. The result was that smaller projects like magnetic mirrors and stellarators lost funding altogether, and global efforts focused on three big tokamaks, JET, TFTR in America, and JT60 in Japan. And at this point it did seem like break-even was on the horizon. You could look at a nice logarithmic graph of what's called the Q value for a fusion reactor. A Q of 1 is break-even, a Q of 2 means you generate twice the power you use, a Q of 0.1 means that you need to put in 10 times as much power as you get out, and so on. Qs were steadily rising by factors of 10 every few years, in experiments in machines like the Princeton Long Taurus, and later TFTR and JET when they came online. Soon, tokamaks went from taking all that input power and generating enough fusion reactions to power a wristwatch, to enough to power thousands of homes if the energy could be harnessed. It was still less energy than you put in, of course, but the rate of improvement, if extrapolated, made it seem as if the break-even was just another few experimental shots away. But as we discussed in last week's episode, the timeline had to be stretched out a little bit, and then a lot. The first generation of machines designed to reach break-even came online back in the 1980s, back when mobile phones were the size of houses and American Psycho looked like a documentary. Now it's 2019. Mobile phones are the screens through which we view the world, and um, American Psycho is more or less still a documentary. This episode we're going to talk about JET, one of the few currently working fusion reactors in the world, one that I've visited several times as an Oxford student, and the reactor that currently holds the world record for approaching break-even. Let's zoom back and very quickly overview what Europe has been up to in the fusion game, since we laugh left them behind after the Zeta failure at Harwell. In 1968, when that famous expedition to the Soviet Union to learn about tokamaks took place, the scientists involved were British, but the first European tokamak was the tokamak TFR in France. This started construction in 1970 and began operation in 1973. This device was quite similar to the T3 tokamak that the Russians had demonstrated beforehand, but a few key parameters were boosted. The plasma current, which you'll remember involved running an electrical current through the plasma to result in a compressive force from the magnetic field lines, was tripled relative to the T3. It had a thin copper shell, conductive metal, to help stabilise plasmas by allowing charges to move through the shell and counteract any magnetic fields that are established by deformities in the plasma, which we've talked about as being used in previous reactors. And it also had a weaker magnetic field that helped them to control the plasma position more precisely. This device improved on the T3 in terms of how it could confine the plasma, and in terms of temperature that could be attained, but it also introduced the European scientists to the problem of disruptions, these sudden and violent instabilities. Eager listeners will remember that one disruption at jet caused the entire tokamak to jump into the air by a few centimetres. These can occur when the plasma is polluted by impurities, or when its density becomes too high, and you get a disruption in the current that flows through the tokamak. And this led to the idea that maybe there might be a maximum density that could be allowed in a tokamak, before disruptions would automatically occur. Because a denser plasma takes up less space, but also has more collisions and therefore more fusion reactions producing more energy, the upper limit on density meant that future machines had to be larger. Remember, magnetic confinement fusion scientists want to have a high triple product. High confinement time, high density, and high temperature. Now the density had this apparent upper limit. Tweaks to the magnetic field were attempting to improve the confinement time beyond a few milliseconds, and temperature also proved very difficult. Beyond a certain point, apparently due to particle losses, additional heating seemed to have little effect. It was found that the temperature varied as the square root of the applied heating in these devices, 
which made attaining fusion temperature very difficult. The square root rises initially quickly, but very quickly you have to throw in quite a lot to your square root function before you're getting any effect out. As the first generation of European tokamaks was producing these results in the 1970s, the community quickly realised, as the Americans did, that it would be necessary to build a bigger tokamak. A working group called the Enriquez Group was created. It proposed the objectives of the tokamak to be built, its size, and a cost evaluation. They decided that it would be a circular cross-section and operate with 3 million amps of plasma current. The main objective was divided into four sub-objectives of study. They wanted to study the confinement of the plasma, how effectively they could heat the plasma, what happened when impurities were produced during the plasma heating and the interactions with the walls, and the alpha particle behaviour. So once the required conditions had been reached, you actually get fusion and you actually get alpha particles out. So how do these particles affect the behaviour of the plasma? What happens to their confinement and do they produce any additional plasma heating? All of this required a fusion power reactor high enough to be measurable in the presence of the additional heating power. So that is to say, if you want to examine the behaviour of these alpha particles, you need to be producing enough of them that they actually have a significant effect on the plasma. At the time, though, they had no idea whether this heating would actually degrade the quality of the confinement. So there was this question that if you even get the amount of heating power that you want from the plasma, maybe the confinement just falls apart. So it wasn't known at the time whether that would work or not. This device then was planned to be an intermediate between a laboratory tokamak working on the properties of plasma and an experimental reactor operating with tritium. The main difference between JET, then, and the big American tokamaks is the cross-section that was chosen for JET. This was a D-shape rather than the circular cross-section that was preferred by TFTR. Funding more or less exclusively came from what was the European Economic Community, now the EU, although the Cullum site in Oxfordshire in the UK was chosen as the site for the reactor. Naturally, Brexit has complicated this whole thing, particularly because, for some inexplicable reason, the politicians chose to also withdraw us from Euratom, which is the European Community for Regulating Atomic Power and Nuclear Energy, as well as managing agreements about nuclear research. There were genuine political fights about this. I mean, did anyone really mind if we signed up to international rules about how to deal with radioactive substances? But apparently every person who voted to leave was terribly keen for us to have to spend millions of pounds coming up with our own regulatory bodies to deal with nuclear energy and research issues, because if there's one thing Brexit was about, it was about sovereignty for atoms. But I digress. The Euratom problems left the future of JET in some degree of turmoil, but given that it is the largest Western tokamak currently operating, and ITER will theoretically be finished in a few years, it will probably ensure that they just keep it running until ITER is up and going, and then all the fusion scientists will naturally end up migrating to there anyway. The WAGs might say that it's unusual for a tokamak project, but JET actually produced its first plasma on time, within its allocated budget in 1983. Fears that the vacuum vessel will be destroyed by pressure from the plasma turned out to be false, and indeed it still operates with the same vessel today, it's never been replaced. The subsequent story of JET is much like the life of any other experimental tokamak. The experimenters vary things like the plasma current, the cross-section of the plasma, the methods of heating used. So. We're talking about these neutral ion injections, remember, where you inject these very quick particles that you've sped up to the plasma. And you also try and heat up the plasma by accelerating it, by bombarding it with these electromagnetic fields. The aim is always to see how well and for how long you can control the plasma parameters and determine these empirical scaling laws. So you want to work out which knob can you twiddle that gives you a better confinement time, which knob can you twiddle that gives you a better temperature, and once you have controlled those things, can you get a better triple product, or do you actually start to lose confinement? And what are the modes of instability you see? Why is the plasma uh, falling apart as it always does? You know. For example, early on in JET's operations, it was confirmed that the confinement times tended to depend strongly on the plasma current, which makes sense, as it's this that actually constricts the plasma to the magnetic axis. Typically, when JET is operated, the scientists involved have a specific plan for the pulse. The pulse of plasma only lasts for around 40 seconds. And you can watch videos online of the plasma flicker and glow as it starts to fuse and then falls apart again. For a few brief seconds in the middle of a pulse, the insides of the jet tokamak are the hottest thing in the solar system, hotter than the heart of the sun, which can rely on gravitational pressure to make fusion easier than with magnetic confinement. The pulse might be aiming for a new record in confinement time or plasma temperature or plasma density. Much like TFTR in the US, the tokamak has achieved the confinement time, more than 1.5 seconds, the temperature, 100 million degrees Kelvin, and the density, 10 to the 20 particles per cubic metre. 
that have been calculated to obtain break-even and even maybe harness net energy from fusion. The only problem is that it's not been able to achieve all three at the same time. There are three different processes that go into heating the plasma. The current heats the plasma in the same way that passing a current through a thin filament in a light bulb produces heat, but as plasma resistance decreases as it heats up, this can only heat the plasma to a certain limit. You'll remember from your high school physics maybe that the amount of current heating that you get from a plasma is I squared R, where I is the current and R is the resistance. So you can see that if your resistance is actually decreasing as the plasma heats up, uh, eventually that heating will drop to zero and you won't be able to heat up the plasma anymore. For the rest of the heating then, the neutral ions need to be injected at speed, bashing into the particles and transferring their kinetic energy, and radio waves accelerate the plasma with electromagnetic fields as well. Some notable physics milestones for JET were its first fusion using deuterium tritium plasma in 1991, and its record for the maximum power produced in any fusion shot in 1997. This is worth remembering, by the way, whenever anyone tells you that fusion is around the corner, or that the latest startup will be producing fusion power commercially in the next 20 years. In many ways, this has become a long-haul game. That record is 16 megawatts of power, which is approximately the same as eight regular wind turbines, finely measurable on the scale of other power stations. It's a considerable amount of power, but that happened more than 20 years ago, and no one's been able to best it since. So evidently, it's not a simple prospect to do better than JET. But here come all the buzzkill caveats. It released this record amount of fusion power for less than a second, of course, because achieving the correct combination of parameters meant that JET couldn't achieve its record confinement time. And of course, it still didn't quite reach break even. The power used for heating the plasma in the famous 1997 shot was approximately 24 megawatts. Remember, Q is the ratio of power in to power out, and so Q equals 1 is break even. Eta aims for Q equals 10 in a demonstration power plant, and an actual power plant would need an even higher Q. So by this calculation, JET's record shot for fusion power achieved a Q of two thirds for less than a second. And if you want to be a real buzzkill, of course, you just need to point out the obvious. The way that this break even is defined is not the way that you or I, or most importantly, the energy companies would define break even. Here, break-even is defined as when you generate as much fusion power as the power used to heat the plasma. But the power that actually goes into heating the plasma is only a very small fraction of the overall energy used by JET. You have to operate the huge confinement magnets. You have to create the plasma in the first place. In fact, when JET is switched on, it briefly uses approximately 1-2% to of the electricity used by the entire UK. Between 600-700 to megawatts of power for all the various uses in the tokamak. The power drain from JET is high enough that it can't draw all of its power from the national grid without causing blackouts in Oxfordshire. So instead what they do is use these huge flywheels, actual rotating heavy wheels. They're gradually spun up over time, and then, when they need to release all that power, they spin down quickly to generate these brief bursts of high power electricity. But of course, to an accountant, or anyone who's practically interested in turning fusion into a real power source that can displace fossil fuels, this is a long way from break even. In fact, it means that JET, for a brief second, generated less than 2-3% of the energy that was required, in total, to power the tokamak. And of course, it's worth adding on that none of the energy produced by JET, in the form of heat, was harnessed. We don't really know, in a working fusion reactor, how much of the heat energy will be possible to harness, because one hasn't been built yet. But we do know that fossil fuel power plants, which have been operating generating power and being ruthlessly optimised for engineers and capitalists for over a century now, can convert usually around 30-40% to 40 of the heat generated by burning fossil fuels into electricity. Now one commenter did note that you can have these special combined gas cycle plants which can get up to 60% efficiency, and that's true. It's not necessarily that 30-40% to 40 is the absolute limit of efficiency for fossil fuel power plants, or that it's some golden thermodynamic limit that we can't really necessarily surpass. But, in all likelihood, a fusion reactor will be much less efficient, at least at first. I mean, you just have to think about the process. In a fossil fuel power plant, you burn some coal, oil, gas. That heat directly goes into heating steam, which drives a turbine. In a fusion power plant, though, most of the energy is in the form of these incredibly hot neutrons, and you need to find some way to divert that energy into heating up steam or whatever to drive your turbine, and convert it into electricity. I think the fraction that you're going to be able to get from just a big old fire with oil, 
coal, natural gas or whatever, is going to be far higher than the fraction that you're going to usefully be able to harness with these hot neutrons. After all, one of the big problems in making these plants is diverting the neutrons to where you want them to go in the first place. So, if you imagine that a fusion reactor will be less efficient, at least at first, and will probably never get up to 30-40% to 40 efficiency in terms of converting the thermal energy to electricity, which means, as far as the accountants are concerned, you would need to make jet a hundred times better, a thousand times better, before it can even talk about breaking even in terms of energy produced. Now, if you read the ITER website, they point out that ITER will use superconducting magnets which require less power. It's very true. They estimate that it will get you down to 200 to 300 megawatts of total power use. But it seems likely that even if ITER does achieve its goal of generating 500 megawatts of fusion power from 50 megawatts of heating, the physicists will say Q equals 10, but the accountants will say that it just broke even. And even then, since it can only generate its power for short bursts of time, the rest of the time that it's running and the building is being operated and so on, when you're not generating power, you're essentially losing money. So it's a big problem. Each new generation of tokamaks, though, does tend to improve things by an order of magnitude, a factor of 10 like that. But now that each new generation of tokamaks is taking 40 years and billions of dollars to build, it's a little less feasible to wave away some of these arguments. Nevertheless, JET does hold the record for fusion power generated and the number of fusions occurring in a pulse, and given how many clever people and organisations have had shot at that record, it's something to be proud of. They no longer hold the record for the highest confinement time, though, that was set by one of the other big three, the JT-60 in Japan, which managed to confine a plasma for 6 minutes and 30 seconds. At the time of writing, pending some unconfirmed results in China, these are the magnetic confinement records, and they all use tokamaks. As well as generally advancing the physicist's understanding of scaling laws, new physics was discovered in JET. It's probably become clear by now that each new successive generation of fusion experiments reveals another problem, another barrier, another difficulty which requires the next generation of experiments to correct. We've talked about previous issues with confining the plasma, heating it to fusion temperatures, and leaky magnetic bottles. At this point though, the key phenomenon that was holding JET's plasma performance back was turbulence. So it will serve us to briefly describe, what is turbulence? In fluid dynamics, a very simple way of categorising the flow of a fluid is using the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is a simple, dimensionless ratio of quantities, that means it's just an ordinary number, that tells you, broadly speaking, how the fluid is behaving. At very low Reynolds number, we have laminar flow. You can imagine layers of fluid flowing past in parallel layers with no disruption between the layers. Imagine water in a gentle stream or viscous honey being spooned around the place. At high Reynolds number though, the flow becomes turbulent. Instead of the previous motion that was simple to categorise and predict, and you could even describe it with a normal mathematical function, with the layers flowing past each other without any disruption, at high Reynolds number, we now have chaotic motion, individual particles spraying in all directions, whirling around in little complex vortices and spirals. Chaos evokes the idea of disorder, but it's also extremely unpredictable. Tiny changes in the initial conditions for such a flow can result in a completely different pattern. We see turbulent flows all the time in nature. The rushing rapids of a river over rocks, the flow from a hosepipe or a tap turned up too high. We can even see a classic example of a laminar flow becoming turbulent. Light a match or candle, or watch the next time you see someone smoking. The smoke initially streams from the flame in ordinary laminar flow, but quickly becomes turbulent, curling and swirling away in various different directions. Turbulence is one of the most important remaining unsolved problems in physics. It's an area of physics where we still don't fully understand the underlying equations or how to solve them. Instead, much work is done empirically, by observing the systems and trying to deduce what we can about how they behave on average while the particular, precise behaviour of the system is still mysterious. And that's just turbulence in an ordinary fluid, for ordinary hydrodynamics. Add in the complex, interacting electric and magnetic fields for magnetohydrodynamics, and you can see why the problem of turbulence in plasmas is so complex to solve. It can drastically increase the loss of particles and energy, making both confinement and heating processes far less efficient. In your idealised system, in the one that you write down on paper, it might be impossible or unlikely for a particle to escape confinement or make it through the electromagnetic field lines in your tokamak. But with turbulence, individual particles of the plasma can cross the field lines and escape. Simple parameters like the time scales, length scales, and energy scales for these tiny turbulent vortices and eddies have long since been derived theoretically and measured experimentally.
famously the Russian scientist Kolmogorov in the 1940s, worked extensively on the problem of turbulence, and the way that it actually serves to dissipate energy in thermodynamic systems, predicting these time scales, length scales, and energy scales. But being able to sketch the edges of what plasma turbulence might do, and being able to predict precisely how it will affect the plasma in your tokamak, are very different propositions. Huge amounts of theoretical physics and computational simulation time have been devoted to trying to understand plasma turbulence in more detail. Studies will look for large-scale patterns in the turbulence, correlations between one region of the plasma and another, and how the confinement times relate to the turbulent behaviour that's observed. One key discovery of this era of magnetic confinement fusion was something called the H-mode. It wasn't actually discovered at JET, instead it was found at a German tokamak known as Azdex, a small tokamak only around 3-4 to four metres in diameter. Like other tokamaks, part of the heating of the plasma occurred via the technique of neutral beam injection, accelerating ions to high velocities, neutralising them by combining them with electrons, and then injecting them into the tokamak. When the atoms hit the plasma, they become ionised, and they stay confined by the magnetic field, allowing them to efficiently transfer their energy to the plasma through collisions. When the neutral beam heating on Aztex was turned up past a certain threshold, there was a sudden, apparently mysterious and inexplicable change in the plasma properties. The plasma becomes more efficient at transporting particles, energy, momentum, and impurities around the tokamak. But the key aspect to this strange new mode of behaviour is that the turbulent motion in the plasma is suddenly and dramatically suppressed in the H-mode, which led to doubled confinement times. That's why it's referred to as the H-mode. The H stands for high confinement, while all previous plasma states are referred to as L-mode, low confinement. The ETA website notes that if H-mode had not been discovered, it might have been necessary to build a tokamak twice as big to dream of achieving break-even, doubling all of the issues that we've talked about with making fusion practical, and probably preventing ETA from getting off the ground. While the initial tales of the H-mode were met with scepticism, it's now been a focus of intense study for at least a quarter of a century, and the design of most tokamaks and stellarators aims now to move operations into this regime of plasma behaviour. The precise reasons that it behaves as it does are still somewhat mysterious, though. In traditional understanding of turbulence, it's driven by gradients in pressure, temperature, or number density, and this follows from what we understand in fluid turbulence normally too. After all, a fluid turbulence when a tap or a hose is turned up too high arises due to large pressure gradients. In H-mode confinement, these gradients increase, but turbulence is actually suppressed. One of the experimental observations that might help to explain this is the observation of something that's called shear poloidal flow in the outside of the H-mode confinement. In other words, while the bulk of the plasma flows around the axis of the donut-shaped tokamak, at the edges, in the H-mode, it flows at right angles to that up the sides of the to tokamak's donut, and parallel to the magnetic field lines. So you can imagine that actually the plasma is sort of wrapping around the donut coil of the plasma at its edges in the H-mode, and kind of helping it to keep confined, uh, preventing too many particles from escaping. Some plasma physicists view this as a kind of self-correcting phenomenon within the plasma. So its fluctuations and instabilities become so strong when you increase the heating and get it into this H-mode, that via electromagnetic induction, they're almost inducing a flow at the edges which serves to cancel them out. So this follows qualitatively from Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism, where you have Faraday's law and Lenz's law, as they're sometimes called, which is this idea that magnetic fields and electric fields will tend to be induced that oppose the change that causes them. So this is the sort of the principle behind most of our power generation, is this idea that you are fighting a force that's opposing you and transferring energy that way. Theories along these lines, then, where the plasma might actually correct itself because of how its particles interact with itself, have led to the more modern idea that rather than trying to cancel out every possible plasma instability, perhaps by creating an incredibly fine-tuned magnetic field that finds every individual instability and stomps it out, you're better off attempting to work with the instabilities and relying on self-correcting effects like this to take care of them for you. After all, for all we know, it would never be possible to produce a magnetic field complicated enough to suppress every known instability. Yet, yeah, this strategy may not be successful, because just as H-modes suppress one brand of instability, another one is introduced. So-called edge localised modes, or ELMs, arrive in the H-mode. Because there are sharp gradients of density and temperature towards the edges of the plasma in the H-mode, as it transitions into this flow up the sides of the plasma, you get these occasional violent periodic expulsions of particles and heat from the side of the plasma. 
These are like a disruption, but in miniature, and only in sort of one part of the edge of the tokamak's plasma. And once these particles are expelled, they smash into the tokamak walls and can cause damage to the equipment. Because they're so rapid and involve sudden bursts of energy, not only do they reduce the efficiency of the device, but they can also damage the first wall and the diverter with the high levels of heat and particle flux into the edges of the tokamak. Together with the disruptions that still plague tokamaks to this day, finding some way to understand and tame these edge localized modes is still a major concern in fusion engineering, design, and in theoretical and experimental plasma physics. There are mechanisms that allow ELMs to be completely suppressed in tokamaks, but they have their own disadvantages. The impurities in the plasma, due to the neutral beam heating, rise too quickly, leading to disruptions. Often it can feel like the story of getting this strange, mysterious and complex phase of matter, plasma, to behave as we want it to, is a lot like juggling. Tweaking this parameter gives you better confinement times at the expense of temperature. Taming this instability tweaks another one into being. You can see, given the history, the complexity, and the intricacy of tokamak design and plasma physics, and the fact that we still don't fully understand what's going on, why dreamers might think that here, on the edge of break-even, we just need to stumble upon the right plasma mode, the right magnetic field configuration, the right serendipitous discovery, and we'll have cracked nuclear fusion. You can also see why cynics might suggest that new problems will continue to spring up with each apparent development, and prevent fusion from ever being commercially viable, even if ITER achieves a net power gain. Pulsars at Jet aren't just for testing this kind of new physics though. A Pulsar Jet might be trying to test out a new piece of equipment. Recently, as they've become more and more focused on becoming the testing ground for the next tokamak, ITER, this has become more common than attempting to reach new peaks in plasma performance. For example, we've talked in previous episodes about some of the issues with practical fusion reactors. Materials need to be able to stand up to bombardment from incredibly hot neutrons that are difficult to stop, and they need to deal with radiation from accelerating and decelerating plasmas. They need to survive disruptions, and they need to protect the delicate electromagnets that actually confine the plasma. JET is the only facility that can produce conditions even remotely resembling what ITER will be like, particularly when it comes to these hot neutrons, which you simply can't generate by many other processes. For that reason, in recent years, they've tested a tungsten wall. With the highest melting point of any metal, this aims to limit the plasma impurities that arose in previous tokamaks due to the plasma becoming contaminated as it melts the walls of the reactor which can lead, of course, to disruptions. We also discussed how valuable tritium as a fuel was for nuclear fusion under the deuterium fusion reactions, and that, in fact, for fusion reactions to be remotely economically viable and sustainable, you need to be able to recover as much of the tritium from the interior of the wall as possible. For this reason, they've tested walls that contain beryllium. Beryllium is an element that most of us don't have much cause to deal with, although it's surprisingly low on the periodic table. Three protons in a nucleus gives you beryllium. So it's hydrogen, helium, beryllium, lithium, etc. Four out of every million atoms in the Earth's crust are beryllium, which gives you an idea of how rare it is. For that reason, it can cost between $5,000 and $10,000 for a kilogram of the stuff. And yet its unusual properties make it one of the leading candidates for use in ITER. It doesn't absorb tritium, and stands up to the punishment from these hot neutrons better than carbon fibre based materials, which quickly became radioactive and had to be replaced. Recent plasma pulses have focused on testing the performance of these beryllium and tungsten materials, but also the distribution of the materials. Beryllium's melting point is over 1000 Kelvin, smaller than tungsten's 3000 Kelvin. Beryllium is therefore the most suitable for operations where there are limited interactions between the wall and the plasma. The tungsten layer, then, is for the diverter, where leaking hot particles of plasma actually come into contact with the wall of the reactor, which dissipates heat by transferring it to a coolant. This diverter configuration is very important for sustaining heat inside a plasma. It acts like a mass spectrometer, separating particles according to their masses, removing the heavier elements and impurities from the plasma that cool the plasma and dissipate the energy that's needed for fusion. And the diverter could well be another big problem with a fusion reactor. It's all very well creating something that won't melt for a few seconds of operation under jet, or the minutes of operation under ITER, but if a fusion reactor is really going to operate for hours or days at a time, producing a steady base load of power, you'll need a substantially stronger material than we can create now, or possibly a different technique that allows the plasma to cool down by colliding with layers of neon gases, for example, before hitting the diverter. If you don't have a diverter, though, those loose particles of plasma will erode the walls of the reactor, resulting in plasma impurities that will cool the plasma below fusion temperatures, or even cause disruptions. Part of what Jet showed is that a configuration where 
the divertuous at the bottom of the tokamak, towards the bottom edge of the plasma cross-section D, is likely the best place to channel the leaky plasma. Indeed, it was adding the diverter that allowed them to reach the record fusion energy production that we discussed earlier. Studies in this eater-like wall want to determine how much tritium fuel is retained by the beryllium tiles, and precisely how adding these new materials into the reactor changes plasma impurities. It seems likely that, at least until 2025 when first plasma is due at ITER, and maybe even 2035 when deuterium tritium experiments are due to begin in earnest, JET and the results from JET will remain crucial to our understanding of how tokamaks work, and hence crucial to the possibility that ITER and magnetic confinement fusion in general will be a success. Okay, this JET episode was pretty mammoth, but it's worth spending time on a tokamak that is so near and dear to my heart. We actually have a bonus episode coming up based on materials from the Cullum website which will describe how a jet pulse actually goes down. But as our fusion story moves closer to the modern day, we're going to leave magnetic confinement fusion for a few episodes. We'll discuss what happened to the major inertial confinement fusion experiments using lasers, including the huge National Ignition Facility in the US. We'll discuss the international pact that led to the creation of ITER. We'll talk about some of the dark horse startups that are trying to make nuclear fusion a reality. But first, we have to deal with one of the most infamous episodes in the history of fusion. And yes, I'm talking about Fleischmann and Pons. Thank you for listening to this episode of Physical Attraction. Remember, you can find out more about us at our website at www.physicspodcast.com by following us on Twitter at PhysicsPod or the Facebook page Physical Attraction. All of those venues, you can contact us with any comments, questions or concerns about the show. The contact form on our website is very useful, and uh, I read all of the emails that come in there, so please do feel free to come up with any comments you'd like about the show there. You can also find donate links and our Patreon account, which is patreon.com slash physical attraction, where you have the opportunity to subscribe in exchange for a few bonus episodes that we've recorded, just as a thank you to those who want to help support the show financially. But of course, the best things you can do for the show are always to tell as many people as you can about it, and review us on whatever platform you like, just to get the word out. Until next time then, take care.